Okay, so uh, very brief introduction. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm an Agile coach. You can get me on Twitter at Lunivore um, or I'm Lunivore at mast.to if you want my Mastodon. I don't check it as often as I should. Um, I've been talking about Knevin for many, many years now. Um, I'm going to introduce it very, very quickly. Today, I'm mostly going to be focused on the constraints that are inherent in the Knevin framework. And I'm going to be comparing that to a bunch of models, including Wardley mapping and uh, crossing the chasm, as promised. All right. So just to start with, if you haven't come across the Knevin framework before, it's created by Dave Snowden. It is a framework for making sense of different situations and how to approach them, depending on how um, certain or uncertain they are, how predictable or unpredictable they are. Hands up if you have not come across Knevin before. A few people, great. So this is your intro. If you want more information, Dave Snowden's got an absolute ton of um, videos and articles about it. Uh, if you want something that's a little bit more comprehensible, uh, I've written a Knevin for Everyone blog post at lizkeo.com. Um, and it will help you make sense of some of the academic terms that Dave tends to use. Um, so the different situations we come across, the first kind of situation we tend to come across as a kid is usually clear. It used to be called simple or obvious. So a, a clear problem is one that even a kid can solve. You look at it, you go, oh, yeah, I know how to solve that. You can categorize the problem. It's one of those, duh. And it's completely predictable. As things become more and more complicated, they require more and more expertise. So a watchmaker knows how to fix your watch. A car mechanic knows how to fix your car. The outcome is known. And you can close the gap between what you have and what the outcome should be. Uh, that's called analysis. So analysis works really well in the complicated domain. These two together are called the ordered domains. They are both predictable. Cause and effect are correlated, obviously, or with expertise. OK. The domain we don't like and try and avoid is chaos. This is not used in the kind of random sense. This is all in the complexity thinking sense. I'll talk about the complex in a moment. But in this, in the Knevin framework, chaos is accident and emergency. It is your house burning down. It is people bleeding to death. It is dominated by urgency. It is also the domain of urgent opportunity, but it's normally regarded as a pretty bad place to be. It is transient. It resolves itself really quickly and not necessarily in your favor. There is no time in chaos. You have to act and act quickly. The domain that trips us up most, though, is the complex domain. And the complexity thinkers call themselves complexity thinkers because of the problems we as human beings have dealing with this stuff. Because we really like predictability. We crave certainty. And there's a ton of experiments I normally talk about in longer to Nevin talks around the proof that this is so. We would generally rather have a certain bad outcome than put up with uncertainty. When we learn things, it gives us a nice little kick of serotonin. We discover we can apply those patterns that we've learned to other contexts. When we try and apply the patterns and we fail, we get the opposite effect. We really don't like it. So this is where confirmation bias comes in, right? It's why we're just horrendously bad at dealing with it. But in complexity, you have some time. The outcomes are going to emerge. We don't know what they're going to be in advance, but we can correlate them in retrospect. So cause and effect are correlated in retrospect in the complexity. Not at all in chaos, by the way. It's really hard to work out what caused the fire while there's still a fire. Right? You probably want to not be in the fire at that point. So in complexity, we have to do something called probe, which means to try something out that's safe to fail. You can think of it like an experiment, though very often the hypotheses in uh, complexity, you tend to get, the, you can often get the opposite effect to what you expect, and it might still be a good thing. Okay, so you have to treat the indicators of success or failure with a little curiosity. All right, so that's Kenevin. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the, these constraints. Um, so the strict constraints that you get in clear problems, I think of that like putting a plug into the wall. There's only one way to do it. It is very constrained so that you cannot get it wrong because getting it wrong would be catastrophic. It's also extremely standardized. One plug, one socket, um, unless you're from Europe or the States or somewhere which has different plugs. But there's very few different formats of plugs. Um, in com the complicated domain, we have um, governing constraints. 
and I will explain those in detail. In the complex domain, we have enabling constraints. And most of this talk is going to be about the difference between these two and how we get them mixed up. Right? In Chaos, we have no constraints at all. In the middle, it's a domain of disorder. Disorder is where we don't know which of these domains dominate, and so we behave according to our preferred domain. So I'm going to do a little experiment just because we have some new people in the room. Put your hands up if you've ever been asked for an estimate in time or money for something that you have never ever done before. Keep your hands up if you are foolish like me and you gave one. And keep your hands up if that then turns into a promise or a commitment. Right, there you go. Disorder in a nutshell. Right, we treated something that was emergent as if it could be made predictable. And it's really common that we have that way round, that you're treating something complex as if it's complicated. There are places where I've got into trouble because I didn't read the instructions probably, properly and I should have gained the expertise by carefully reading the instructions before I started. Um, but, you know, I'm a dev, so sometimes I just like to hack things together and, and not read the instructions, and it's bad when it's like here. Okay, so that is the Kinevin, Kinevin constraints in detail. So what does this look like? So I'm going to talk a little bit about chaos first, because chaos is a place where we have no constraints, and it's, it's not intuitive that that would be the case. But if you think about it, fire burns until it's consumed everything and it's run into some constraints. So it will burn everything within a larger set of constraints, right? If you don't stop the, the burning by putting a constraint like fire extinguisher or water on fire, it will burn your whole house and it will keep burning until it runs out of fuel or runs out of oxygen. The only thing you can do if there are no constraints and there is unconstrained growth of something is to put constraints on it or to get out of the larger constraints that it will, will eventually hit. So here is a lovely picture of a wildfire, and there is the firefighter trying to put the fire out. And it's going to take more than one. Yeah. Often you see things like fire breaks in a forest because they've made an artificial constraint on the fire just to keep it in place where it is. All right, so governing in strict constraints. These are, I'm going to treat these similarly because they're both things that you apply on predictable strict is just harder than governing it's more strict than governing but it looks pretty much the same so you can think of these like hard containers like a cup right the things in the cup cannot escape the cup there is no permeability to them there is no escape from them they are context free that means they apply regardless of context um, they are robust which means they are strong, but when they break, they break catastrophically. Dave Snowden uses the example of a seawall. It's a fine thing to have a seawall until it breaks, as it did in Louisiana. And this is a picture of New Orleans in Hurricane Katrina, and you can see the road is completely flooded. Right? You get catastrophe. So it breaks catastrophically. Constraints can also be tethers. And tethers can either be things that snap into place or they can be things that um, have some elasticity to them. But uh, those are the constraints. So how does that contrast with enabling constraints? So an enabling constraint is usually permeable. It is contextual, which means it doesn't always apply. You can choose when to apply it. It's resilient. That means, um, Dave Snowden uses the, the term that it changes its nature without changing its identity, right? So it changes its properties, but it still remains the thing it is. So a seawall isn't really a seawall when it's got a big hole in it. It stopped being a seawall at that point. But a salt marsh is permeable. So a salt marsh gives you some warning. It's got some holes in it. Um, the tethers, incidentally, are often attractors, so there might be something that draws you towards a point. Um, but a salt marsh, you get some warning when the sea is coming in, and it can absorb it. And it remains a salt marsh. When the sea goes out again, it's still a salt marsh. So, quick quiz. Enabling or governing? A cage with a tiger in it? 
governing, right? If it breaks, it's going to be a catastrophe. OK, how about a venue capacity? Enabling or governing? Enabling, governing. I think when it breaks, it breaks catastrophically. Right. So as long as you're inside the, the, the venue's capacity, as when there's too many people, it's fine until it breaks and then the people can't get out and then there's a fire, etc. And you get crushed and it, it's really bad. So the venue capacity is, is there as a rigid constraint. Um, how about a refunds policy enabling or governing? It's governing if you're a cashier, but the manager can override it and can say, yeah, all right, we'll give you a refund anyway. OK, so there is a little permeability to it. As always with Kinevin, these things aren't categories. Some things can be more complex or more, um, more complicated, right? So it's relative. So you can have things which are more permeable than others. One of the things I like to do is to look at the, the, the procedures that we've got and say, can we make some permeability in something that's a little bit too strict? Does every single change have to go through the cab board? Could we maybe phrase a kind of change which wouldn't have to go through the cab board and we could do something really small? And if we made everything look like that, could we get away with Agile? Right. Two-week sprint, enabling or governing? When it breaks, does it break catastrophically? Do people go, oh, no, we didn't finish all the stories we signed up to and they feel really bad and it's a disaster? Is it called a failed sprint? So you can use it either way. But software development is always driven by trying to solve a problem nobody solved before. It's always driven by something new. Somebody's going to be able to do something they couldn't do or in a new context or with some new quality. Otherwise, why would we be doing it? So there's always something emergent that's driving it. If you try imposing rigid governing processes on something that's emergent, you're in disorder. And when disorder persists, it creates chaos. It breaks catastrophically. Whip limits, enabling or governing? Enabling, enabling right. If you break the whip limit, the column goes red in JIRA. Oh, well. <laughs> Never mind. Or you can just go and change the whip limit for a bit, you know. Um, it happens. You get production bugs. You have to put the thing on, on the burn, on, the, on hold and go jump on something else. The column's gone red. It's going to be red for a bit. It's given you a warning. OK. Deadlines. Governing or enabling? It depends. OK, Christmas as a deadline, is that governing or enabling? Is it going to move for you or is it context free? <laughs> it's context free, right? It doesn't care what your software is, is what, what software you're trying to deliver in time for Christmas. I've actually worked at John Lewis and their Christmas rush is a, it's a joy to see. Everybody knows that this deadline is coming. They treat it pretty pragmatically. Um, I worked at The Guardian. We were trying to get the galleries out on the Guardian website in time for the Oscars. The Oscars were not going to move for us. These are genuine deadlines where an opportunity will die. As opposed to, we think we can finish it inside three months. And somebody goes, that's great, and starts making promises and commitments around it. That we call a sad line. No opportunity is going to die, but someone somewhere will be sad. It's amazing how much more pragmatic people are around deadlines where they know there's no room to get away with it compared to sad lines where as long as you can get something out, the quality doesn't matter because their reputation is the thing on the line. And they will be sad if they can't say, yes, it's done, and then any bugs are the development team's fault, right? I've uh, heard some people are, are actually using the term sad line now where they mean just like, it's aspirational or it seems reasonable. It's coherence. Coherence is what we call in a probe a realistic reason for thinking that this is a good idea. Right. OK, so constraints at work. Constraints when they are governing and strict are hard and fast rules. They apply regardless of context. You cannot get round them. Um, anything which a computer is doing 
computers cannot make contextual decisions. They only make decisions based on the rules and the behavior you have set up. So they tend to be governing. So any process that a computer is running is generally a governing process. Um, I'm not going to go into AI because I'm not a specialist. Um, guidelines and heuristics are what we want for enabling constraints. So a heuristic is something, it's like a rule. You know when you're obeying it, but you don't have to. So the heuristics the military use are things like stay in contact, take the high ground. And you can tell when people are doing it, but if there's a good reason that people think that that hill is not the place they could need to be on, they can choose to do something different. So it enables some flexibility. So this is Crossing the Chasm uh, by Geoffrey Moore. Um, it's a lovely, lovely little model which basically says you've got these innovators and early adopters when you first start producing something. And at that stage, you have very little market share. Um, a shout out to Chris Matz, by the way, who gave me the, most of the language I'm using for this. Um, the innovators and early adopters are willing to work with you to solve your problems. They can put up with a few bugs. They can put up with some manual workarounds because what you're doing is wonderful to them. Nobody has ever done this before. It's amazing. So you can get away with enabling constraints. You can get away with your product having to, having to tweak it to deal with different contexts. Then there is a chasm. Once you have crossed the chasm, you enter the world of the early majority and you are no longer trying to solve a problem. You are selling a solution. And the people on that side of the chasm do not want to see alphas and betas. They do not want to see prototypes and proof of concept. They just want it to work. And they will not put up with bugs. And they give you poor feedback if you have bugs. On this side of the chasm, you can have enabling constraints. On the other side, you probably want more stability. So sometimes those governing constraints can be good. Your CI CD pipeline is a governing constraint. Can you put your hands up if your teams or people you work with can deliver at will? So a few of you, yeah? Yeah. OK, <clears throat> so. Wardley maps. Um, Simon Wardley has a similar model. The way that the Wardley map works is on the uh, <coughs> y-axis here. Excuse me, I'm just grabbing some water. On the y-axis here, we have uh, customer visibility. So you start with the customer at the top, and then you map your architecture, your systems, how things flow. He particularly says how capital flows. How do you make money? What stuff allows you to make money? I like working with capabilities. I think capabilities are a great way to map this out. So what are people able to do? So rather than saying, you know, it's the AWS server, it's like, what is it doing for you? What's the system able to do? What are people able to do with it? Those map really well, by the way, to epics in JIRA. Usually people kind of make that extinctive. So you'll be able to go and look at your epics and go, OK, are people just able to do something? And can they do it now? Can we actually release that and turn the feature flag off? Um, but you can map them on this. On the X axis, we have how mature it is, how commoditized it has become, how stable it is. So in here, he's got the online image manipulation, which was a new thing they were working on, just come out of Genesis. And there's some photo storage that you need to have. You need to be able to manipulate the photos. You need somewhere to store those while you're manipulating them. You can also print them out. Um, and you can see it goes down until you've got the computing and the data center. One thing he said was that the platform at the time was moving off this way, off to the left. Right? So everything moves to the left. Everything becomes more and more stable. So I often use the example of a camera phone. Cameras used to be a really rare thing on phones. Kyocera and Sharp made the first ones pointed towards the user because they thought people would use it for video calls. Nokia then spoiled that differentiator. And now who's got a camera on their phone? Yeah, of course we have. It's become commoditized. And the beautiful thing is that once things become commoditized, you see an ecosystem start to build on them. So you see differentiation in the types of camera. You see stuff like Pokemon Go 
that rely on you having a camera on your phone. QR codes, because right, we all have the cameras. So you get this ecosystem builds on commoditized stuff like AWS. As you get further and further left, so those constraints have to become more and more strict. The chasm here is represented as a little dotted line. I did a talk called When Maps Go Bad, and I said, they're lying to you. This map is lying to you. See that little dotted line? That's the chasm. And there's not just one. This, is the, this one between custom built and product is the one that uh, Jeffrey Moore talks about. But you can see there's one between Genesis and there's one between product and commodity as well. So there's actually several chasms that you have to cross. And it's hard. It's probably quite intuitive that the stuff over this side is complex, but the movement on the map is also complex. Automating f something for the first time is also new and emergent. So, Kenevin, um, it's got these dynamics in it. I just talked about what it looks like if you've got a phone and a camera. And we spend a lot of time in this red liminal threshold, which is actually the bit where we kind of know what we're aiming for, but there's still some emergence happening. So we're working towards a vaguely known outcome. It's not proper complexity where we're running multiple parallel probes. Um, I've had a thing where we, we had several engineers working on something independently, and then we brought our ideas together and chose from them. That's properly what you would normally do in complexity. Most of the time we're working towards something, we kind of know what it should look like. So this is the cycle we are in. Um, startups, oh, sorry, some things super stabilize and go down here, but not too many. Um, anybody involved in the Log4J debacle? You would have thought Log4J was quite stable, right? This little fold at the bottom is complacency. Uh, and you can tip from something that's blindingly obvious and you're not worried about into complete chaos. Um, chaos grazing is what I, a lot of startups do, where they stabilize things just enough to move on to the next thing. And there's a thing called the shallow dive into chaos, where you separate people. As I said, you know, they separated us as devs to get our ideas. So it avoids the consensus culture where everybody comes together because human systems are complex and we all like making each other happy. So we all agree to something that's very average and not very innovative. If you want the widest variety of ideas, you separate people. Um, there's a blog post I've written which has more information about that. And Dave Snowden's done loads of blog posts about it as well. OK. There's a, so that's the shallow dive into chaos. And those are the Kinevin dynamics. So you can compare those to some of our processes as well. So lean production, I see a lot of people use lean production as an analogy, and it's where the term Kanban came from. Um, lean production lines, it's the same car being churned out again and again and again, maybe in some different colors or with some different adjustments, but it's pretty much the same car. We don't do that in software development. The closest thing we have to the lean production line is our CI CD pipeline. Right? What we do is more like lean product development. It's more like creating the new car. And we do a different car goes down the factory line every single time. And it has to be predictable when it hits production. <laughs> right? um, Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma belong down here. This is where you absolutely minimize the variance to make sure that those resistors really do have the resistance that they say, or that the screws are to the micrometer accurate. If you try and minimize variance in complex systems, you stifle out all the innovation. And I keep seeing people promise, you know, predictable delivery. I'm like, well, something went wrong there. Because if you're doing something new and you've never done it before, you don't know how long it's going to take. And the discoveries will tend to slow you down more than they speed you up. If I estimate something at five days, it could be five days quicker might not take any time at all, but it could be an infinite amount slower. Right? Your bell curve assumptions don't hold. OK, chaos doesn't really have processes except for the fact that we drill for chaos. So you see firefighters run drills. We practice um, chaos monkeys. Have you ever seen the, the chaos monkey thing that goes around your, your system and just randomly shuts things down to check that you're able to respond to it while it's safe to fail? You're practicing, you're drilling for it. All right, so close to the end. Um, 
Why is this important? This is uh, the Bain analysis from 2007 called the alignment trap. Again, you can look this up. But basically, the idea is you want to be up in IT enabled growth, really well aligned with customers, great engineering practices. If you try and get aligned with customers before you get great engineering practices, you have buggy, buggy stuff that they don't like. And it turns out you lose market share year on year and your IT, point, your IT goes up. You have got to get those systems in place, that beautiful pipeline that's going to build your software for you. I took out a slide because I didn't realise I, I realised I didn't have time. But if you ever get a chance to look at Julian Birkinshaw's ad hoc receipt model, he talks about what happens when labour and production are the scarce resource and how it leads to a bureaucracy. That's your testers doing all their manual testing. You've got to automate it. OK, so I said the maps lie. If they told us the truth, this is what they would look like. Here is the genesis. There are dragons between the genesis and the custom build. There's mountain ranges, mountains of madness. It looks like a Tolkien novel, right? There's a reason we call them epics. And then you've got the, the yawning chasm of, do, the chasm of despair between the products and the commodities. OK, the work, a lot of the work is in actually stabilizing the stuff. Um, Jeffrey Moore talks about Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3. So Horizon one is the stuff that's in production, making you money right now. Horizon three is your R&D. It's the innovative stuff that you're developing. And Horizon two is stabilizing that for Horizon one. And we fight for, it fights for budget with Horizon one. Horizon two fights for budget with Horizon one. So you've got to actually t pay for the time for things to stabilize. Otherwise, you'll end up with buggy code and people don't like it. Um, There's one other constraint I want to talk about. That's it. 380 billion tonnes of CO2 is how much we can burn before we hit 1.5. In fact, they reckon we're probably going to hit 1.5 above pre-industrial levels uh, sometime this year or next year for the first time. And it will be temporary. And then we'll do it again. And then we'll do it increasingly more often until it's the norm. That's how much we can burn before it becomes the norm. This is how much is locked into the reserves that are active right now. Um, it's about three times as much as we need to hit Tuesday. If there is anything you can do to persuade your leaders to pay attention to climate change, please do. Thank you very much. <laughs>